Hey, welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue the conversation of quadric surfaces. We're going to cover three different examples, but using exactly the same te techniques that we have previously. We'll be looking at intercepts to see if that can give us information, and then looking at certain traces, hopefully these traces on the planes if we can, if not different traces to get an idea of what these surfaces look like. Our first example here is a hyperboloid of one sheet. You might be asking, what does it mean for one sheet? Really, we have to wait to the end of the video to what it means to be one sheet versus two sheets, but it's kind of this idea of continuity that we've seen previously with one variable functions. But we're looking to sketch a graph of x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 minus z squared plus 1. This is a bit different than our other graphs because we have this minus z squared right here, and we'll see how uh, what effect that it has on the graph. But let's start here with our intercepts. And as always, I like to start with the z-axis intercepts, um, where we have a 0 for our x and our y. When we plug in a 0 for x and y here, what we get is this negative z squared equals 1. Well, actually, since we're squaring our z variable right here, there's no way to get a value of 1 out of this. We'd be taking the square root of negative 1. We're only considering real numbers for these functions. And so actually, we don't have a z-axis intercept. That should feel weird. We've had intercepts before. Um, we'll have to think about what that means about this figure. But let's move on and just look at the y and the x-axis intercepts. So for the y-axis, we have a 0 for the x and the z. That's just going to give us this y squared over 9 equals 1. Multiply both sides by 9, take the square root. We get plus or minus 3 for the intercepts along the y-axis. And now for the x-axis, we do exactly the same treatment. We get a 0 for the y, 0 for the z. And what we're going to get is x squared over 4 equals 1. Quick math gives us that we have plus and minus 2. So let's plot those intercepts on our axes. Again, thinking about what does it mean for it not to have a z-axis intercept. Um, and what's going to be interesting as we look at these traces, what we're going to see is that this surface is going to follow in ways along the z-axis, but never cover it. It's going to kind of come close and then bounce off kind of near the z-axis. So it will go through the the x and y axes as we do have intercepts here, but not the z axis. So if we then move to the x, y trace, setting z equal to zero, uh, we get a familiar friend here that is an ellipse. We have x squared over four plus y squared over nine equals one. And we know this as an ellipse. The major axis here now is an, along the y axis from negative three to positive three. And along the x axis, that minor axis of this ellipse is from negative two to two. And we can plot this on our graph. And that all feels very familiar to us at this point, looking at these uh, quadric surfaces. If we now let y equal to zero and look at the xz trace, so this term would go away, and what we get is x squared over 4 minus z squared. I'm going to write that as over 1 equals 1, just so that we can really understand or remember this shape right here. So the difference between these two is this negative in this second term. This is actually a hyperbola with an axis along the x-axis. So this is opening along the x-axis. And if we throw the, the image of this trace on our axes right here, you maybe start to get an idea of why this graph doesn't cross the z-axis. But let's now look at the yz trace by setting x equal to 0 to get a fuller picture. And when we set x equal to 0, we lose this term, and we get y squared over 9 minus, and again, write it z squared over 1 equals 1. And importantly, again, this is a hyperbola. This hyperbola is facing in the direction of the y-axis, which is allowing it to cross the y-axis. And now we get to see really the full picture. If we put the full surface on here and look at these traces, we get a feeling of what we were looking at. If we would have continued with traces that were parallel to the xy plane, we would have gotten these ellipses. But then as we look at these other traces, we have this hyperbola that are bouncing off of sorts vertically, right? So they're coming in towards the z-axis, but never actually reaching the z-axis and then bouncing off. 
Again, at this point, it's important to say if any of this is feeling kind of foreign, go back and look at your conic sections, your ellipses and your hyperbola, the definition of those, how those are drawn. I'm sure you've seen them at one point. Importantly, these hyperbola have these slant asymptotes that in the end behavior of these along these axes right here, um, they have this asymptotic behavior on these slant asymptotes. And I don't know why, but I always feel compelled to relate this to something. This looks like some kind of fancy vase, though it's infinite vertically, so maybe uh, not the greatest vase in the world, hard to maneuver around. Um, but importantly, again, this is a hyperboloid of one sheet. It's one, you could have one piece of paper of sorts. If you think about it, you could create this. When you see the hyperboloid of two sheets, you'll see that it would create two separate pieces of paper. You would require two separate pieces of paper to create that surface. And for these last couple examples, I'm actually not going to go through all the work of showing each of the traces. I'm just going to talk through it. The hope is, as you see these moving forward, you can actually identify the traces, what types of traces they'll be, just by looking at the nature of these terms. So for this example, which is z equals x squared minus y squared over 4, we're just going to consider what would happen if we took these planes that had constant z values. If z is greater than 1, what we're going to notice is that these are hyperbola again, with our, have axes parallel to the x-axis, so they're opening along the x-axis when z is positive. When z is negative, would actually would take that negative value and distribute it over here, which would make the y term positive and the x term negative, which would mean they're hyperbola that are, have axes parallel to the y-axis and are opening then the other way along the y-axis. So let's represent a couple of these traces for positive z values and for negative z values to see what's going on. And you'll see that switch after z equals zero, we're going to switch from going along the x-axis to along the y-axis. And again, it's because the distribution of a negative that comes from that switch from a positive z to a negative z. And it's important to note, because we're not squaring z, there is that switch that happens as we translate up and down the z-axis. But if we now just look at the xz trace and setting y equal to zero right here, what we'll just get is z equals x squared. So if we're comparing the z with the x plane right there, we just get a parabola and that won't change much. All we're gonna get if we changed our value for y right here, we're gonna get some shifting down and that's because we're just subtracting a constant value from this parabola. And let's take a second now to show that xz trace. This is starting to look like a really interesting quadric surface. Let's now look at the yz trace. And what we're gonna do there is just set x equal to zero. And when we do that, we're gonna get something very similar to what we got for the xz trace. When x is equal to zero, what we get is that z equals negative, I'll just write it negative one fourth y squared right there. So that's a parabola that's now open in the negative y axis direction because of this you could think of it as a vertical flip if you're looking down at the y-axis right there. So we have this flip, um, and we're still a parabola. We have a parabola in the x direction and a parabola in the y direction in, ter in terms of the relationship to the z-axis. And then we put that trace on our axes and then complete the shape. You'll see that this is a really an interesting shape. We have these hyperbolas from one of our perspectives and from the other two perspectives, we have these, these parabolas that gives it this interesting point that we're gonna call a saddle and you're gonna see us come back to shapes like this very soon. And I was just trying to think of an interesting name for this shape, but I don't. It's some kind of weirdly twisted piece of paper. Let's now take a quick look at elliptic cones. We have y squared over four plus z squared equals four times x squared. And really the nature of this, we can move around any of these variables that we want. They're all being squared in this case. We could move this over, you would see that it'd be a negative, but we'll often put it in this form right here. Um, because of the way that this shape will rest when we have this term on this side. So let's first focus on what happens if we set x to a constant. If we set x to a constant value like x equals 1, what we're going to get is a constant like 1 here. And over here, we will recognize that we're going to have an elliptical shape. So when we take these planes where we've set x to be a constant and take these snapshots, we're going to have these ellipses.
And then if we look at the xz trace, again, by setting y equal to zero in this case, what we're going to get is z squared equals four times x squared. If we solve this by taking the square root of both sides, what we're going to find is we're just going to have these linear relationships between x and z in this case. And so this is actually just going to be a line. So then if we look at the xy trace where we set z equal to zero, we're actually going to have exactly the same situation. We have y squared over four equals four over x squared. When we multiply both sides by four to get rid of this, and then we take the square root, we're going to be again composed of two lines, or more specifically y equals plus n minus four x. So then if we put all these traces together again, we'll just remind ourselves what was going on there. When we're looking along these planes that are set by constants on the x-axis, what we have are these ellipses. And then on these other traces, we have these straight lines. And if we complete this shape, what you can see is that we have these elliptic cones. Importantly, in this three-dimensional environment, we don't just get what we're used to in normal geometry as one cone. We kind of have this double-sided cone. And we didn't do the work, but you could easily verify then that the only intercept, as with one of our previous examples, the only intercept is through right there at the origin, which is the tip of these cones. And I know at this point we're coming fast and furious with these examples, but we don't, don't worry about the absolute small details of each of these. It's just a general experience about how we're using these traces and intercepts to sketch these graphs and better to understand why they have the shapes that they do from these different perspectives. But let's finish it kind of where we started, but now looking at a hyperboloid in two sheets. What we have here is negative x minus two quantity squared minus y squared over four plus z squared over 16 equals one. Importantly in this example, we now have a constant value. Both the x and the y are negative, and the z is the only positive term. What you're going to see when we look at this graph is that that restriction we have because this is the only positive term and we're not equal to zero, meaning this right here, z specifically, has to be at a minimum has to be equal to four. It has to be four or greater or it can be negative four or less, but z cannot contain a value like two. If z was equal to 2, we would get 4 over 16 would be the only positive term, but we're adding negative terms. These are strictly negative values when we plug in x and y, and we won't be able to build up to this constant value of 1. That in itself is what creates this two-sheet concept that breaks this from being one continuous surface. Now, just to say it real fast, if we were to look at setting x to 0 or y to 0, we would see that we have all these squared terms, one positive, one negative. So when we look at the either the xz trace or the yz trace, what we're going to get are hyperbolas that are opening along the z-axis because that is our positive term. So finally, if we consider traces that are found from the intersection of these planes that are constant z values greater than or equal to four. And I'll only really talk about greater than four because when it's equal to four, we're just going to get a zero as a constant over here. But when we're greater than four, what we're going to have is this term, again, setting z equal to five or something like that. We're going to get a value bigger than one, and then we're going to subtract that over. So we're going to get a negative constant over here equal to these. Now it feels a bit weird, so we have these negatives, but if we just multiply through by a negative one, I get a negative number over here and negative terms here, we're gonna find that we'll have a positive x squared term, a positive y squared term equal to a positive constant, and that will be an ellipse. So any trace of this nature right here will be elliptical. And so let's put all that information together and take a look at this beautiful quadric surface here this hyperboloid in two sheets. And what you can importantly see to point out here is that separation between the two parts of it. Um, there's the reason for the two sheets. That's not this one continuous looking object that we had the vase when we started from before with the hyperboloid in one sheet.